Greetings, welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. I'm Salvador Cordova. This was an impromptu discussion on the Big Bang, and Andrew said he was curious to find out about my views on the Big Bang. Um, so what's on your mind, Andrew? Yeah, so I, I heard you made a, a video about the, uh, the Big Bang specifically earlier. Um, so okay. I guess I'm... I'll, I'll summarize my views. Um, Michael Disney, this is the... Yeah, you read that, that article from Michael Disney. I remember that. So the important thing for the viewers is to, to look at the table he presented where he uh, shows the level of confirmation. And it's actually in his... Okay, there are two versions of this one. And the one in my earlier one I have to pick up. Uh, if, if you can give me a moment, because this was so sure. impromptu. And I'll, I'll, I'll show it because this one is more comprehensive. So the one, he had a more popular article in um, American Scientist. The one that was, that I read today was much more detailed. And I'm going to show that one on the on the screen. And I think that's that's the one that's going to be um, that'll lay out the gist of it. Okay. Okay. So. Sorry for any noises in the background. My dog is uh, okay uh, around. So. Let's see. Anything that has uh, a confirm has so in the extreme right hand corner. So these are the free. Okay, in column three are the free parameters that are under consideration. That, that if this entity uh, is not there, this won't work. That's the way I read it. Okay. Any number that's negative or zero is not good. So we can just look at it. And as we look at this table, this is really bad. We don't have uh, sufficient confirmation. And then he'll go into the references of the specific issues surrounding all of this. So one number here, like minus 10, the large scale structure of the universe is still, I think, extremely problematic. Why we have galaxies uh, that cluster and then our superclusters and the superclusters then form strings. That just, uh, that's very problematic. So I could see why they're putting this factor of minus 10. So if we were gonna talk about why I, I'm skeptical of the Big Bang, we could, we could comb through each of these and that would be grueling. But, uh, and really the gist of this is that he's not saying it's necessarily wrong, but it doesn't look like a robust theory. So a robust theory would have numerous experiments confirming it. Um, so like a very simple equation like Newton's second law, which is F equals MA, even though we, everyone will admit it's an approximation, it's we know the limits of the approximation and its validity. Meaning, you know, you want objects that are macroscopic, not quantum scale objects like atoms, right. and you don't want things moving at relativistic speeds. Within those parameters, within those um, constraints. The theory has a bazillion experiments confirming its legitimacy. So for some of these other things, it's like, uh, how can it be independently verified? So, um, and he describes that there are five layers that construct, it's really five, the modern Big Bang theory now is really five layers with the top layer being dark energy, the bottom layer, the most foundational is the expansion of the universe. Next is inflation. Somewhere in there is nucleosynthesis, and the other one's dark matter. 
I don't know which one is, he, he has it in his paper. So it, it, it's possible we could still have an, kind of like a Big Bang Theory without dark energy. We might have a Big Bang Theory without inflation if we invoke variable speed of light or some other mechanism. And, and so this is kind of complex, but I, one has to think that when we have all these layers, a complication of unverified, is it, does it really qualify as an empirical theory? So, I mean, an origins theory uh, by its nature might have some things that we really don't know, but when we have to invoke physics, we can't test like inflation and or directly like even expansion which causes some problems you know um, just because it's a solution to the einstein field equation doesn't mean it's correct i could come up with solutions to the newton second law f equals ma and if i put negative mass it's you know you can make mathematically correct solutions it doesn't mean mean it's physically sensible well, so, well, that does, and, does correct but we do have uh at least in my view independent confirmation that there is indeed spatial expansion of space going on there or sorry metric expansion of space uh going on in the universe uh, well that's not according to his table and there there are other there are other possibilities for this so um do you do you happen to know of any yeah um John, Jonathan, John Gideon Hartnett published an archive. And of course, it's not going to get peer reviewed because there's, you know, a lot of this is blocked. It's starting to, the cracks are starting to open now where peer review is starting to allow this because there's, there's discontent. And I've sensed that when I was among the graduate students and faculty, even at the school where someone won the Nobel Prize in dark energy, that was Adam Rice. But in that school, some of the faculty and students were still and graduate students were were not endorsing it. You wouldn't hear that about, like, say, Newton's theory within its within its domain as an approximation. So this grumbling is not comfortable. So the one that I would point to, and people say, "Oh, it's not peer reviewed." It's like, okay, you know, the issue is not <laughs> peer review. Is just finding people that approve of you. It doesn't necessarily mean it's right or wrong. And so I'm going to well, point well, out the article by true. John. It is a, a quality okay. check, though. All right. All right. You asked me, you know, so you asked me what it was. I'm going to give, I'll, I'll put it in, see if I could dump it in the side chat or something here. Sure. I see we have someone in the side chat. Hey, our dying son. So, uh, John Hart. Net archive. John Hartnett is a young earth creationist, but he is a right. very accomplished secular scientist too, 200 peer reviewed articles. He, uh, I'm going to read this for the sake of, okay, so if you're going to invoke quality checks, I just need to point this out. Um, if you if you expand this to the internet sphere, people that have dropped out of high school, burned their brains out on drugs and alcohol, compared to me, I have five science degrees. They're not qualified to criticize me. I'm just pointing that out. If you're applying that standard there, So if you want to go on his show and say stuff about me, you need to point that out to him because he uses that same argument, basically. And if he applied it to himself, he should disqualify himself from criticizing me. And I've also published in biology journals and in biology venues, so which is more than probably he has done. I've worked with geneticists and biochemists so, you know, um, if, if you're going to apply that standard about quality checks and qualifications, it go, it cuts both ways. Well, I, I wasn't necessarily talking about qualifications per se. I was more talking about 
uh, the peer review process specifically. Well, I, I know you were, and I'm just pointing out, you know, if if you're going to apply that, then apply it also to the internet sphere. So and so is, and I'm not going to mention his name. He's not my peer. He's way beneath me. He's not qualified to criticize what I have to say. I've just been disgusted with the garbage he has to say. You can't represent anything that I've said for the last year accurately. He doesn't okay, comprehend. Okay, it. I'm just fed not, up with it. Again, we're not talking about. And, and, and I know you might show up on his show. And he might be watching this. I'm just fed up with it. You know? There, there are people here like Dr. Dan. Uh, can you hear me? You see, you're frozen on mine. Hang on, Andrew. I'm going on my backup here. Okay. Let me. Uh, I was saying there's Erica, Dr. Dan. There are any number of people that I get along a lot better with because they have at least the courtesy not to misrepresent what I have to say and attack straw man arguments. I, I just have a real short fuse for that. And when I hear it day after day, I'm just fed up with it. Fair enough. So um, I'm giving you the, uh, can you hear me, Andrew? Yep. A Andrew, can you hear me? Yep, am I am I coming in okay? Yeah. Or, uh, robot my other computer just died. That's why I had the backup. So I'm talking on my backup. This article will give you the um, that I just put out here. Okay. Uh, the archive article by John Gideon Hartnett. I'm trying to open it. Uh... So we can we can read through it. Okay. Yeah, it, it might be better if you pull it up. I think it seems to be lagging a bit. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can get this going. All right. So I'm going to get the PDF. I have to kill some windows here because I have some sensitive material. Just give me a moment. Sure. I don't want it to just accidentally leak out to the internet. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I have my financial stuff out here. I don't want any. Okay. So I'm, get, I'm trying to get my other computer spooled up in the meantime. So... And he's going to cite experiments I'm, I'm familiar with, and okay. they're not represented. So here it is. Is the universe really expanding? And it's by John Gideon Hartnett. So for the viewer's benefit, let's look at his qualifications. He's a young Earth creationist. Uh, I mean, I think this is important to read. John Gideon Hartnett, uh, born 24th March, 1952. He's a young earth creationist. He received both his BS honors, 1973, with a PhD with distinction, 2001, from the School of Physics, University of Western Australia. He currently works as a research fellow at the University of Adelaide, South Australia. Uh, by the way, he offered me to be his PhD student, but I wasn't going to go to Australia. It was very kind of him. He's published more than 200 scientific papers uh, journal in journals, book chapters, and conference pre proceedings, holds one patent, works on the development of ultra-stable cryocooled sapphire oscillators, and participated on the Sapphire Clock Ensemble project run by the European Space Agency. He has also written articles for several creationist journals and according to Creation Ministries International, Hartlet, Hartnett believes that God is the real creator of the universe, as the Bible says. 
Research interests include ultra-low noise radar and ultra-high stability cryogenic microwave oscillators and clocks based on pure single crystal sapphire resonators. Applications for the latter are, are to provide low noise local oscillators to atomic physics labs, time and frequency atomic fountain standards, and very high frequency VLBI, very long baseline interferometry radio astronomy. The terrestrial clock technology co-developed by him is claimed to be the most stable in the universe with Hartnett et al. stating that it outperformed the stability of signals generated by pulsars, rotating neutron stars that produce highly, highly periodic bursts of radio waves, such as astronomical sources, are then used as natural clocks, e.g. for tests of physics. Further on, he is interested in the development of cryocooled CSO resonators, detection of WISPs using low noise microwave techniques, tests of the fundamental theories of physics, such as special and general relativity, measurement of drift in fundamental constants and their cosmological implications and cosmology in the large scale structure of the universe. He is also part of a team of scientists who are building liquid helium cooled oscillators used by sapphire clocks for the National Meteorology Institute of Japan in Tsukuba, uh, in Tsukuba, Japan. So those are his qualifications. And I just want to say again, you know, I get along with some people on the other side that don't agree with my views. They show me a lot more courtesy than you know who. And, and that's part of the reason I just get really irritated. It just makes my blood boil. You know, so I'm just going to go on and just keep reading this. If you have any comments, well, I'm trying to start my other computer. I'm going to try to uh, bring it on. If you have any thoughts first. Well, I, I, I guess I could, I, we, we could have a more free flowing di discussion really. Um, okay. But you, you asked me specifically why I don't, why I'm reluctant to endorse, I think is the universe expanding. Or you said you believe the universe is expanding, and I'm just saying there are there are there is some reluctance by some in some quarters that this is the case. Uh, if you wanted to hear why, sure. yeah, you you can sum it up, and then I'll give my reasons why I think that's not a valid position. I don't okay. Think I, oh, yeah. well, well, the best way is. I'm just going to read this rather than my opinion because this is technical enough. You know, most of the time when I talk about biology, I can I can discuss it for some of the stuff off my top of my head. But this is this is so complicated. I I prefer to read from a reference. So that's why I'm just going to read from a reference article by someone who's very senior in the field. Um, so he says here in the abstract, the Hubble law determined from the distance moduli and redshifts of galaxies for the past 80 years has been used as strong evidence for an expanding universe. This claim is reviewed in light of the claimed lack of necessary evidence for time dilation in quasar and gamma ray burst luminosity variations and other lines of evidence. It is concluded that the observations could be used to describe either a static universe where the Hubble law results from some as yet unknown mechanism or an expanding universe described by a standard cold uh, lambda cold dark matter model. In the latter case, size evolution of galaxies is necessary for agreement with observations. Yet the simple non-expanding Euclidean universe fits most data with the late, least number of assumptions. From this review, it is apparent that there are still many unanswered questions in cosmology. And the title question of this paper is still, still far from being answered. And he goes on and on and on, uh, and it's a review paper of experimental evidence. And I think um, he may even mention the Tolman test. So um, if you want to state your view, go ahead, because I have to set up my primary computer. All right. Um, so I guess besides the Hubble distance redshift relation for the expansion of the universe there's evidence that the universe is expanding from uh, 
cosmic time dilation of distant supernova light curves. Um, you can basically think of it as the light uh, travels to Earth through expanding space. Um, its frequency gets stretched, and you can think of the frequency as being related to the the time of the... Oh, seems like I'm robot in a bit. Oh, go on. I'll try to fix this. Oh, um, yeah, so, so basically, oh, now it sounds better. Um, uh, what was I saying? Um, yeah, so the, uh, as the light travels through expanding space, the, the frequency is shifted and the time that we perceive of the distant event, in this case, how long the supernova occurs, um, compared to say a, a recent supernova um, where the expansion hasn't been in, um, as drastic, I guess you could say, compared to a distant supernova um, where the light appears to take more time to get to us between the start and end of the event of the supernova. So in that sense, there's time dilation of the supernova light curves due to the expansion of space. And if you want, I have a article from Talk Origins that kind of goes over that. And I can give you the link if you want. I'll just put it in private chat here. That's all right, because that was addressed in Hartnett's article. Oh, really? Y yes. It, it, it's not like I haven't studied or wasn't aware of some of this. Well, how, how does Hartnett address it? The quasars don't, there is evidence that the quasars don't follow that. Uh, Hawking's experiment showed that the, uh, the quasars have a certain pulse frequency and uh, they don't look time dilated. Well, I wasn't talking about quasars. I was talking about well, distance. Well, it would still apply because they're redshifted. They're also redshifted. So you can't take one class of things and not generalize it to the other. I don't see how you can generalize them. They're they're different phenomena fundamentally. Um Like I need to to see the the specifics of it to Wait, see yeah. like what, what what do you mean exactly okay, by okay. the if you want to see the specifics of it it's in the references there. I'm not saying you have to agree, but you know th this is um, you know this is why sometimes these free form discussions you can we can only uh, explore it at a cursory level because then I have to relate it. Um, well, if, if you want to pull up that, that part of the, the paper specifically, then I'd be open to reading it. Okay. Let's see. Hawkins. Uh, okay. Hawkins, Astrophysical Journal, 553L97. Um, and some people will dispute it, but... Uh, his result. Okay, uh, I'm just going to drop in a, a popular article here. Okay, quasars don't show. Let me put it in the chat. Quasars don't show time dilations. And I'll just, why don't I just show, show the popular article? Sure. Uh, all right, I see it. The phenomenon of time dilation is a strange experimentally confirmed fact of relativity theory. 
One of its implications is that events occurring in distant parts of the universe should appear to occur more slowly than events located closer to us. For example, when observing supernova, scientists have found the distant explosions seem to fade more slowly than quick than the qu quickly fading nearby supernova. So that that again is what you just discussed. Right. The effect can be explained because the speed of light is constant, independent how fast a light source is moving toward or away from the observer, and the observer and the universe is expanding at accelerating rate, late rate, which causes light from distant objects to redshift. Uh, the wavelengths become longer in relation to how far away the objects are from the observers and Earth. In other words, as space expands, the interval between light pulses also lengthens. Right. Since expansion occurs throughout the universe, it seems that time dilation should be a property of the universe that holds true everywhere, regardless of the specific object. That's why I was you're saying you don't see how it could be generalized. This is it, where they're insisting it can be generalized, at least in this article. Okay. regardless of the specific object or event being observed. However, the new study has found that this doesn't seem to be the case. Quasars, it seems, give off light pulses at the same rate, no matter their distance from Earth, without a hint of time dilation. Now, that is a contested article now, but I just don't trust the mainstream anymore, where they just try to bury anything that is dissenting. But the other thing that Hartnett pointed out in his article well, or just to, to clarify, have these results been replicated by any other teams? Of course, no one's going to, not that I know of, no one's really going to fund this. They should be, and that bothers me. So. Well, I mean, un until the results themselves are, are replicated, I don't see how they are are as robust as you say they are. It could be a statistical fluke, for example. So could a lot of things in the Big Bang Theory. I just showed you a table of things that show that it's it's insufficiently robust. If you're going to apply that same standard to the whole theory, it's not confirmed in, in any way. It's just guesses. So if you want to accept it on faith without proof or insufficient proof, that's fine. But let's not pretend that it's well confirmed. Well, I mean, let's start with one of the basic predictions of the Big Bang Theory, which is the uh oh please was here hey leo um the uh idea that um leo Phileas, no perhaps so we ahead. can let him in to uh see if he has any thoughts or perhaps uh, okay. later leo do you want in I guess if if what I say isn't or if I don't make it clear, for example, perhaps he can give a different perspective on it. Well, I, I gave the table from Michael Disney. I'm not saying I'm not insisting it's necessarily wrong. The problem is it's not even robust. Well, we 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 do have robust answers on this now. I beg to differ. I, I mean, I gave the five layers of the Big Bang, including inflation. Um, Nobel Prize winner, recent Nobel Prize winner, Roger Penrose doesn't seem that it think that think that it's credible. This is not indicative of a robust theory when you have someone of his stature disputing it, and then we're having more come out. Well, so, or I, I mean, even, inflation even if it's by a minority, itself isn't why, part of why should, why should, big I'm thing. just pointing out it's not robust. I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Go ahead. I, I said, well, I, I was just saying inflation by itself isn't really part of vanilla Big Bang cosmology. It's more an, an added component to it, I guess you could say. There are different models besides inflation that are equally compatible with a uh, standard Big Bang cosmology. Well, you mentioned variable speed of light models or cyclical models, for example, so off the top of my head. So, so you can go ahead and say, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, well, I mean, are you disputing that, like, the, the Big Bang Theory doesn't explain certain observations, like the... the thermal spectrum of no. the CMB, for example? No. 
Oh, oh, that was a dark no, no, well, let's look at some theories. Geocentrism predicts that the sun's going to rise every day. Doesn't mean that geocentrism is right. Geocentrism is correct. It's well, right, but the, have, the Big Bang theory specifically for, predicted the properties of the CMB. Uh, that's also in dispute. Oh, okay. I'd li I'd like to see a citation for that. Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head. I have some books on it. Well, can, can you give that also, summation? There also, there's also some thought that there's also a local microwave background. There's no way you can actually determine it's omnipresent. Plus, we have the axis of evil. Well, we we know it's homogeneous and isotropic to a very large extent, so we know it is a global. Well, the the problem with it being a local phenomenon is that there is no currently known local phenomenon that could produce the thermal spectrum that we do see in the CMB. For example, the uh, the 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 CMB is a near perfect black body spectrum. That's not something that can be produced by, say, stellar absorption or or other objects in the galaxy or some local phenomenon. Uh, we don't know that. If we're going to invoke things we can't, if we're going to postulate things like inflation theory that we can't prove, um, then it's fair to say we can, you know, fair being fair, we can assume there might be some other mechanism that we just haven't discovered. But well, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, you can't I mean, trade one for another. There's no way, it's unless we have spacecraft all the way out there communicating with us from those distances, we can't absolutely prove it's all over the place. We are stuck well, in making an observation from what's coming into us. There could be something in between. And there well, have been I, I mean, there could be, oil. but there is no there current is. evidence for it. That's the problem. But, well, there's no current evidence for inflation, and people accept it. Well, there is, there is some out, circumstantial if evidence for it. This, you're going to wipe out a lot of the Big Bang, a lot of the patches well, that try to make uh, reconcile it with observations. I'm just pointing that out. Well, I mean, even if you were to get rid of inflation, the standard Big Bang model would still be there. Like I said, it's just an addition to, well, well you, you said to solve some okay, of the I'm problems, sorry. but yes. All right. So going back to this, the supernova time dilation, and a, a point okay. is made by Crawford. Since current investigators assume that the type 1A supernova have essentially a fixed absolute BB magnitude with possible corrections for stretch factor. One of the criteria they use to reject any candidate whose predicted absolute peak magnitude is outside a rather narrow range. The essential point is that the absolute magnitudes are calculating, calculated using BB, and hence the selection candidates is dependent on the BB luminosity distant mo distance modulus. Basically, he's claiming selection bias. Is this not circular reasoning? So what he's pointing out is, what about all the supernova that would fall out of this that don't accord with the time dilation model? Be explained by selection bias. And then we have the quasar thing. So again... Well, I, I, I need to see specific examples of that before I say that's conclusive. Well, I'm not... Go ahead. Look, I'm not, I'm not here to, to convince you. You asked me what I thought. If you don't want to investigate it anymore, you do that. If you're really curious, you could dig into this and reject it. Okay. I, I think this is going to be productive just to say, okay, I'm giving you the resources that are the starting point, and that's all I could do. If you're going to try to settle this in one hour, it's, that's pretty futile for both our sides. I'm just saying that... Um, I've seen a growing sentiment against the Big Bang over time. It's it's getting worse. It's not getting better. If well, you from, if from you, who specifically? Uh, like how what, about Sister Roy? He was a professor at my university. Sister Roy. Say that again. Sister Roy. Uh, I'm not sure I'm familiar but, with okay, who that is. All right. Okay. So. Um, I, I can, all right, I, I've given you in 34 minutes, the resources, if you don't want to read them, that's up to you. 
I'm not here to convince you. If you're, I've studied these, I've sent, I've, I've seen the sentiment change. You may not agree with that, and that's that's fine. Uh, I mean, if you if you want a balanced viewpoint, you can investigate it yourself. Because I can't, you know, um, I'll put in a data point, I'll su suggest a name, and you'll say, well, I'd like to see more. And it's like, well, there's nothing stopping you from seeing more. Uh, you have this article by Hartnett. You have the article by Michael Disney, and they have references in there. And I don't know what else beyond that to do. Is that fair? I, I guess so, yeah. I mean, I, I covered this. I spent, you know, uh, I could spend more time on this on my channel. This would be 40, 50 hours or more. <laughs> and 40, 50 hours wouldn't be enough. And um, my view is we could just wait and see what happens. As we... Well, I, I, I think since, well, it is kind of getting late for me, so perhaps we could set up time for a, a longer in-depth discussion uh, in the coming future, perhaps, where we could go more into these, these papers in depth and uh, go from there, maybe. Um, hang on, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I was just trying to see if Leo Phileas wanted in. Uh, he said, oh, yeah. I'm good right now. Andrew can handle his own. Okay. So he yeah, doesn't. Want I, to I don't think he wishes to come in right now. So, um, uh, well, I, you know, I think it'd be kind of pointless, honestly, because. The way I prefer to do this is I'm just going to read through the papers. Uh, having a back and forth discussion is not going to serve my viewers well. Why? Well, I, I mean, if where, where I'll say something, and you're just going to say, oh, "I, I want to, I want to hear more," and I'm just like, "No, this isn't, this isn't going to work." Well, I mean, you're 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 posing these problems here, and I'm just giving my criticisms of them. But, well, you know. Uh, it's already the mainstream, so it's not like people can't have access to the mainstream. So, so what you've done what, what, is... What is the mainstream? Just to clarify. The, the Big Bang model, okay. or like the expanding space. That's the mainstream viewpoint. And, and so it's not like people aren't aware already. What they're, I'm presuming it's fair to say they're aware of this. What they're not aware of is some of the things in secular li literature or by secular scientists who've been blocked from publishing and what they say. And I have to raise some of that and I'll, I'll do that by reading like stuff like the Tolman test. And I just have to say, it's a little annoying that you're saying, oh, I need to have more. And I'm just like, okay, so you accept other things that to me are obviously not well robust and you don't apply the same standards. So I think, you know, that's what I was saying is that if, if you apply the same standards, I, I wouldn't say that it, it's, it's well, some of these models were well confirmed. I mean, it's not a healthy thing. I mean, inflation was used to help fix the Big Bang problems. So when it falls apart, what else do you have? Do you want to go to variable speed of light or something else? So the problem is when we have to keep adding these fudge factors, it just starts to feel like there's something miserably wrong. Well, I mean, and, and the thing with is, some of the fudge factors you speak of, like dark matter, for example, that's independent of, um, or it was developed independently of cosmological parameters, uh, or like originally came from astrophysical observations, not cosmological ones. But you have to reconcile your cosmology with what you see. And we see galaxies. And that's problematic 
if you have a big bang cosmology dark matter was mentioned by michael disney to help it it helped solve the problem uh and and so you know it's like okay well, I mean, I mean, dark matter was proposed before this, uh, this it, it wasn't proposed to fix Big Bang problems. It was proposed to solve other astronomical observations. Like, for example, the rotation curves of uh, spiral galaxies and the cluster, uh, the, the motions of galaxies within clusters. Um, which it, which aren't observations necessarily related to Big Bang cosmology. So I'm I'm looking where I saw this in Disney's paper. It did solve those, but see if I could find it. Also, I'm not sure if Michael Disney is an actual cosmologist. I know he is an well, There we go again. Okay, there we go again. If you're going to start doing this credentials thing and qualifications, all right. Well, not, I'm not saying okay. specifically if, if you're that go there again, he, I'm, I'm the just qualifications he's wrong. Point. Okay, if you're going there again, I'm just going to have to point out someone that, it, you, you know, someone who's burned out his brains on drugs and alcohol is a high school dropout, then he's not qualified to criticize what I say on this channel anymore. And you shouldn't listen to him. So if you're going to go down that route, you, you know, th this is a double-edged sword. And, it, and the same would apply to you. Okay, so this accords with what you said. Discovered that spiral galaxies are spinning far too fast to be held together by self-gravitation of their detectable contents. There had to be far more dark matter than ordinary matter. Nobody knew what it was, and the theory of gravitation was right. Uh, but if the theory of gravitation was right at large distances, then dark matter was needed in spectacular amounts to hold the largest structures, such as galaxies and clusters, of galaxies together. Such dark matter might well dominate cosmology and it was welcomed by most cosmologists because it might be lumpy enough to get galaxies formed in time, another serious problem that um, we see next. So what I, I was saying was the latter part, the galaxies to form, it needed the dark matter because you have an expanding universe and there's finite time the dark matter is there to help it out. So, so basically, it, it's a patch for that part of the dark matter, but it also solves the other thing with the spinning too fast. Okay, so so you were correct. That, that was the primary reason that they had in, invoked it, but it did solve a problem, but it's still not confirmed that it's there. There's an experiment in 2037 that might that might confirm it that deals with a supernova and gravitational lensing and we had a neutrino detection. Uh, I, I don't know uh, it uh, off the top of my head. So now um, as far as dark matter experiments, let's see if I have one here. Uh, let me let me get another. Oh, 
on the, there there are any number of even recent ones so Okay, in 2019, from physics.org, new detector fails to confirm would-be evidence of dark matter. And I can put that in the chat. And this was the, uh, um, I'll just put it in the chat. And see, this is just not reassuring that we're getting this. All right? I'm not saying that it's confirmed, but you know, this gets to be the sense that this is the idea is being reinforced by groupthink because we're not getting uh, consistent confirmation. So that's one. And so that was let me see if I'll put it here. This is 2019. I'll give you one from 2021. So this is the headline from physics.org. New detector fails to confirm would be evidence of dark matter. And then I saw another headline recently, 2021. Yeah, th this was the same one. Uh, so, I mean, th this is just not reassuring. So, like I said, there's one in 2037. But if you look at what the experiment was trying to determine, trying to guess at some of its properties, then I saw a whole bunch of other papers come out that was uh, just looking like this is even more absurd. It's just not reassuring. I'm not saying it's not there, but, you know, uh, it's not reassuring. And then I, I pointed out that there was, like for the, the time dilation for the supernovas, it could be selection bias. No one's exploring that further. And it's not very good that the, the quasars uh, don't show that time dilation. And there are other problems with quasars. So, you know, I'm just advocating that you can believe it, but there, there are contrary things that should cause one to pause. So, you know, whether you accept it or not, I'm just pointing out there is, if you contrast this with the acceptance of say electromagnetic, classical electromagnetic theory within its domain of application or geometric optics or, um, even Newtonian mechanics within its domain of application, you don't have disagreements like you have at the level of cosmology. And it's not young earth creationists only, it's in the secular world. And these by, by fairly you know, respectable researchers. So you asked about Cicer Roy. Cicer Roy was a professor at my undergraduate alma mater. And this is what happened. Cicer Roy has been, uh, Sister Roy, he's been a critic of the Big Bang for a long time, and obviously he would be blocked here in the United States, but in India, he, he's a little bit more welcome. And he's since left George Mason back to India. And so I gave you the name Sister Roy, Sister Roy Big Bang. And um, let me see if I could find it on my website, uh, and I'll give it to you. The thing is, it, is his publication was not highlighted in popular science articles in the USA. It was in India, and I found out where it was um, highlighted. Okay, so mainstream. I'll give you. I'll dump this in the reference. He was a professor at my school along with two other professors that came out against the Big Bang in 2003. And you wouldn't have heard this because the US had basically deplatformed it in the United States. 
So it ended up being in the New India Times. So that's just the way it is. If you so let me put this in the chat. Okay. I'm going to read this since you asked, you haven't heard, heard about him. I'll tell you more. He was a professor at my school from the Indian Express. Okay, now this is a popular science writer. I, you know, he may not get all of his details correct. That's not the fault of the researchers. Um, and this was just like, when was the date of this article? March 2021. Yeah, last year. In what could dramatically change the way astrophysicists look at the birth of the universe, four Indian scientists, including from uh, Bengaluru, have challenged the Big Bang theory uh, related to its origin. The theory holds that the universe is born out of a highly compressed, dense, and microscopic point called singularity, which exploded with huge force some 13.8 billion years ago, resulting in everything arising from that singularity moving outwards in all directions. From this, all cosmic matter, as we know today, was formed at different stages throughout time until now. The Big Bang Theory was based on observation of redshift in the light spectrum. The light wavelength emitted from an astronomical object that is moving away from us exhibits a shift in the light spectrum towards the red end. The Big Bang Theory is supported by the understanding that the shift of light toward the red band in the spectrum is continuous and uniform in nature, an indication of all matter, galaxies and cosmic matter, moving outward steadily, but at great speed. Working the outward movement backwards, it would mean that it all began from a single starting point in this quote unquote center of the universe, singularity, which is now, which is how the Big Bang Theory is popularized among astrophysicists. But now a research paper published recently in the prestigious International Journal Astronomy and Astrophysics, Professor Cicer Roy from the National Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, Ben Galaru, um, and he, there's some other names, have reviewed findings contrary to the continuous and uniform nature of movement of light towards the red band of light in the spectrum, spectrum casting doubt and challenging the Big Bang Theory itself. So there you have the, uh, if anyone wants to look up the paper, I'm sure they can look it up. I think, let me make sure I drop this in the chat. Uh, Cicer Roy was a professor at my school in George Mason. He, um, I actually, when I was going to George Mason, he was a professor there. Obviously, he, he went back to uh, to India. So anyway, let's see. I think um, I lost Andrew. All right, just looking through the side chat. So anyway, um, that's an example of the mainstream having challenges with the Big Bang. And I've seen more and more of those um, articles starting to leak out over time. And more recently, more recently, we had um, 
Uh, more recently, we had Roger Penrose going out on inflation. So, you know, these other layers of the Big Bang are there to help uh, fix it because if you have an expanding universe, you have other complications you need to patch. And so when those patches start to fail, when those patches start to fail, um, then you have to question the underlying theory. So Andrews did uh, the time dilation or the supposed time dilation of supernova. And I pointed out that uh, Crawford here, let me just read it because this is a good part. A similar point is made. Okay, so let's let's look at this here. All right. So the light the light curves were adjusted for a stretch factor, W equals S times one plus C, which is claimed to be due to time dilation as a function of epoch, the epoch being Z, that's the redshift. The redshift the redshift of the source. This is absolute, absolutely required for an expanding universe. In fact, it is the only redshift mechanism on offer that requires it. To my knowledge, this time dilation factor is the only evidence for an expanding universe that sets it apart from a static universe. So this is, again, one of the experimental tests, the Hubble law or the relationship between the apparent magnitudes and redshift of galaxies is not sufficient grounds to establish an expansion. Since Zikri proposed this tired light idea and many other possible redshift mechanisms have been theoretically suggested, though none have gained any sort of general acceptance like cosmological expansion has. To date, one author has compiled 31 mechanisms giving a quantitative description of how large shift redshifts may possibly be related to distance. With the analysis of supernova light curves, the stretch factor W correction is determined by hand, an empirical fit to the best selected data. The study that showed this constrained results found a sample of light curves proportional to one plus Z to the B, where B equals 1.07 plus or minus 0.06. This seems to be the most definitive measurement of time dilation where B should be identical with unity. However, a possible criticism is that the time under the light curve could depend on the intrinsic brightness of the supernova, the correction factor S, which might vary considerably with redshift. Lopez Corredoria, Cor Corredor Dora provides a very good review of this and that is reference 59. A similar point is made by Crawford. Since current investigators assume that the type 1a supernova have essentially a fixed absolute Big Bang magnitude with possible corrections for the stretch factor, one of the criteria they used is to reject, reject any candidate whose predicted absolute peak magnitude is outside a rather narrow range. The essential point is that the absolute magnitudes are calculated using Big Bang, and hence the selection of candidates is dependent on Big Bang luminosity distance on the on the Big Bang luminosity distance modulus. Basically, he's claiming selection bias. Is this not circular reasoning? Of course, the answer is yes, circular reasoning. If you select only the candidates that fit the desired luminosity distance criteria and use them to determine the luminosity distance, since one cannot determine the absolute magnitude of the sources without assuming a cosmology, the standard concordance criteria, and that's stated there, uh, are used to calculate the absolute magnitude for candidates, which, mu which must be in a narrow range near MBE approximately minus 19. I don't know what that is, unfortunately. And the acceptable ones are used to test the same model and therefore determine the values of omega m and omega. I think that's lambda. This is confirmed by 26, who state, for any individual supernova 1a, the intrinsic width 
is unknown. So without assuming a one plus Z dilation, the intrinsic width and dilation cannot be separated. It is not, <coughs> it is not an independent test of the Big Bang. Um, okay, so nevertheless, for the selected supernova, the regression fit to the derived absolute magnitude of the sources are expected to be 2.5 log one plus Z. Redshift dependent shows that the luminosity is proportional to one plus C alpha or alpha equals 0.23 plus or minus 0.07. Uh, this means that their intrinsic luminosity must have slowly decreased as the universe evolved. There is new, no reason why the mass of the white dwarf progenitor stars for these supernova should increase as the universe ages. Hence the resulting, hence resulting in brighter explosions. Okay, this could go on and on. Um, and I'm just saying the literature on this is difficult. As I was reading those paragraphs, I was, my eyes were rolling. I'm like, uh, I'd have to I'd have to spend hours, maybe days trying to learn some of those terms. And I, I'm already at, I'm already someone that's had a cosmology class and this is like not easy and as i'm going through this i'm just like my i'm just like this is going to be a headache to explore this so we could um yeah testament says but seriously guys imagine believing in inflation okay so what do we do since we can't possibly you know there are people that are spending their lives on cosmology and they come up with their old pet theories, and we know all the pet theories can't be true. So there are a lot of people that are gonna invest a lot of time and effort, other professional lives, and they risk being wrong. For me at a personal level, I'm just gonna, and this has served me well, I'm just gonna sit on the sidelines and watch this play out because as it's played out, I've seen more descent. The descent is growing. Now it's still a minority des descent, but it's it's starting to grow. You keep reading the headlines, and you see the dissatisfaction among a minority. And I'll tell you, it's even stronger um, in the universities, kind of uh, in quiet discussions. And uh, you know they're 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 acknowledging it. So I've just sensed this sentiment all the time. And you know, from my perspective, having professors at my school dissent, and then you see them now get published um, in publishing papers that are critical of the Big Bang, I'm like, okay, you know, that has an effect on me. So who do we trust? And I'm like, okay, well, maybe we can hope that the scientific method actually does start to correct itself. And, and bad theories start to get dumped. We're seeing that happen in abiogenesis. We're seeing it happen reluctantly in some parts of evolutionary theory. And I'm hoping it's gonna happen with the problem of radiometric dating and uh, change in nuclear structure. Uh, and if not for young earth creationism, it would be great just from the standpoint of nuclear physics and our understanding of how nuclear structure can change. So I'm just saying, you know, we could spend years reviewing all the relevant papers and coming to about the same conclusion where we are, where people are just gonna hold to where they are until something changes. So, you know, I just tried to give a little smattering of this and try to serve the channel by saying, okay, there are papers out there that may give you a different look on the data that you may not have heard from the mainstream, and we know that deplatforming is happening, not only at the Twitter and Facebook level, but it's been happening in peer review for ages. It's that deplatforming that has enabled the abiogenesis in abiogenesis industry to keep pumping out garbage paper after garbage paper that doesn't agree with any other science, and the same thing for lots of science and evolutionary theory. Um, if you think I'm being too harsh about abiogenesis, where's the first working cell, guys? Where's anything that we have built, experiment that's been conducted that's claimed to solve 
a pathway for abiogenesis that wasn't seriously coddled and manipulated and um, illegitimate relative to a prebiotic earth. So um, I'm just saying we could keep going down these rabbit holes or we could just say, okay, you know, um, right now it's, it's not, the secular world hasn't completely agreed with maybe what some of our views are and that that's okay. I'm just trying to point out, I'm just trying to point out to sow a seed of doubt that the mainstream may not be correct. We don't have the mainstream disagreeing with Newtonian mechanics within its domain or classical electromagnetic theory within its usable domain or geometric optics or any of these. We have a lot of problems with abiogenesis, evolutionary theory, and Big Bang cosmology. So that's about all I think we can do. And, and so, you know, when people are coming out here saying it's so proven, I'm just like, no, I don't think so. Even if there is a 5% chance it's wrong, I think that's enough to be hopeful that it could be wrong. And, and this is getting, um, this is getting, you know, the descent is growing stronger and stronger. So um, that's about, uh, Mr. Jetty says, how could you get redshift without time dilation at all? Um, I actually don't know off the top of my head. And I don't know if you heard me reading the article by Hawkins. Hawkins, this one. Mr. Jetty, quasars don't show time dilation. And um, I'll point to a, a, a website called laserstars.org that has a different explanation for quasars. So, okay. Just looking from my perspective, I have one set of professors that said the Big Bang is false. Another set that say it's true. That doesn't tell me, that tells me right there there's no consensus. Like we do compared to say other things in physics. And so that's why I was more willing to just say, okay, maybe I'd, I don't have to believe in the Big Bang. So I dropped the one for time dilation. This is one, a professor of my school. I, I said that in the United States, um, this he was deplatformed. So it had to be a paper, in, uh, a newspaper in India that highlighted his work um, that was published in that international journal. Let me see the name of the journal again, just so I get this right. Uh, international Journal Astronomy and Asterisks, Professor Cicer Roy. Okay. And so we have our dying son. And we have Bill Morgan here. So I'm just gonna survey the chat to see if there's anything. Yeah, good morning. Ooh. There are now huge accelerators like Large Hadron Collider or sensitive instruments like Xenon 1T and other hundreds of millions of dollars equipment. Yet no wimps have been observed. Uh, <laughs> no wimps, baby. All right, okay. Um, so, 
So I guess I don't have anything more to say. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone who joined the stream. It was more or less kind of uh, on the fly, impromptu. And uh, so I'm just going to shut it down. So thank you all for joining. And we'll continue uh, with other shows another time. Take care. And God bless you. It's great hanging out with you all. Good night.